welcome to this fourth lecture of the series of lectures the Faculty of Medical Sciences is holding to commemorate the 50th um, anniversary of independence of Barbados. The Faculty of Medical Sciences is fairly young. It started in 2008, and th this building, etc., was put up just for that, so we could teach our uh, phase one or preclinical students. However, the Faculty of Medical Sciences predecessor, forerunner, um, started teaching here in Barbados in 1967, which is just one year after Barbados became independent. Um, it was the, then the Eastern Caribbean Medical School and just did the final year. Some very prominent doctors in Barbados graduated from that class. And about a decade later, it morphed into the School of Clinical Medicine and Research, which the final two years of the medical program was taught, and then in 2008, the full faculty. Lots of the staff um, on the Faculty of Medical Sciences are consultants at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital or may work in the polyclinics, and, uh, and they're associate consultants with the hospital. And many of the consultants in the hospital are associate lecturers with the University of the West Indies. And much of the research done in Barbados, medical research, has been produced by the Faculty of Medical Sciences and Chronic Disease Research Center. With no further ado, I'm going to ask Dr. Clyde Cave, Associate Lecturer in Child Health and Consultant um, Pediatrician and Neonatologist at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital to introduce our featured speaker, Dr. Cave. Children with diabetes, the sweet dilemma, is it diet or DNA? This is the subject of tonight's lecture. Tonight's topic, as you will no doubt hear, is currently of extreme academic and practical concern, especially so in societies like ours, where we are dealing with increasing numbers of young people with diabetes and all the implications for their physical, mental, and social well-being. A full perspective of childhood diabetes therefore requires academic, pediatric, and local views. Tonight's speaker brings all these perspectives to the discussion. Dr. P. for Paula Michelle Lashley is a tenured lecturer in child health and deputy dean clinical of the Faculty of Medical Sciences at this campus of the University of the West Indies. She entered medical school as a Barbados scholar and distinguished herself by winning the doctors Anne and Harry Bailey class prize in clinical medicine and attaining her MBBS degree with honors in 1985. She completed her specialist training in the Caribbean in 1991, being awarded the Pediatric Association of Jamaica's Dr. Leela Winter Prize for the best candidate in the DM pediatric specialty exams. She has been a consultant pediatrician here in Barbados since 1994, supervising an inpatient team of doctors on the pediatric unit and developing her outpatient clinic to include a focus on children with diabetes. She has published and presented on many topics of pediatric interest, including aspects of children in Barbados with diabetes-related concerns. It is therefore my pleasure to present an eminently qualified and positioned Barbadian pediatrician, Dr. P. Michelle Lashley, to address you on children with diabetes the sweet dilemma, is it diet or DNA? Dr. Lashley. As we said earlier, the title of the talk is actually Children with Diabetes. The sweet dilemma, as you'll come to learn a little bit as I go through this, is a parody. And when we talk about diet and DNA, I think we'll explain a little bit more how they're interconnected and interrelated with each other. It is timely that this talk is in April. We didn't choose it to be initially, but it just happens that the World Health Day, was, uh, which was about two weeks ago, April the 7th, was focused on diabetes with the words beat diabetes. And beat diabetes essentially means what are we doing worldwide to prevent, to conquer, and to get better in our treatment of diabetes. But what is diabetes? I know most of you all here, and some of you are obviously in a medical fraternity, know what diabetes means. To the Barbadian population, this is sugar or the sugar disease. And what it's really about is the pancreas, the organ, is not able to make enough insulin or to use it effectively, and as a result, there's high blood sugar. 
The symptoms are the same whether it's an adult or child. And significantly, in a child who is very thirsty and who may be going to the bathroom frequently, they may also begin wetting their bed again. They may also get very hungry but lose weight. They may get sleepy and have blurred vision and then may have school failure. So those little clues will help us in the children with diabetes and in the older child, the dry skin, the infections, which may heal slower than usual. But diabetes is a global a pandemic, not even an epidemic, a pandemic. There are two types of diabetes. Type 1, which is most common in childhood, which is insulin dependent, is caused by the destruction of insulin producing cells or, and the body, resulting in the body having little or no insulin at all. Whereas type 2 diabetes, which is the most common diet type of diabetes worldwide, accounting for nearly 95% of all cases, is more common in the adult population. But 80% of those diabetics who are termed type 2 are thought to be able to be able to have the disease preventable by lifestyle changes. And this is not the same for the case of type 1 or childhood diabetes. What is the scope of this big problem? We think there are over 300 million persons in this world with diabetes. That is a huge number. Statistics from Barbados suggest at least 40,000 known diabetics are present in this island. And that's only half of those who know they have diabetes. So you can double that number right away, immediately. But 50 years ago, this island did not think that diabetes was so significant. So something is happening in the last century that is making diabetes more prevalent. The CMO report of 1965 did not even list diabetes as a cause, a, prob a problematic cause. But by 1985, diabetes was listed as the second leading cause of death. We know that the disease burden of diabetes is significant. There's blindness, kidney failure, amputations, increasing risk of stroke, increasing risk in cardiovascular mortality, and certainly for the type 1 diabetic, the increased risk of cardiovascular mortality is significant. But only 10% of the diabetics are type 1, so we can forget them quite easily. And we need to realize that this is a different disease. This is a disease of children, of young adults, and only about 5% of those type 1 cases actually occur in adulthood. So what's the scope of the problem for childhood? In the worldwide, we think there are about, what we know about, about 600,000 children with type 1 diabetes. And an increase in type 2 is now being seen also in the childhood population. This is representing an annual increase with the studies done worldwide of about 3% worldwide increasing per year. Now, we know a little bit about it epidemiologically from this part of the world. Dr. Oscar Jordan and his colleagues in 1994 published a cases of 37 cases of type 1 diabetes present in the 10-year period from 1982 to 1991, representing about three new cases a year. Do Professor Ann St. John and colleagues in 2004 also documented about 29 new cases in an epidemiological survey in children under 16 in a 10-year period, again looking at a, about three new cases per year. But between 2010 and 2013, we found 22 new cases of insulin-dependent diabetics who were between the ages of 2 and 13. That's about seven per year. That's doubled in that period of time. And today, in the Diabetes Association of Barbados Register, we have 65 type 1 diabetics registered under the age of 18. And we can document at least another 15 to 20 who are seen outside in private practices throughout the island. These are children with diabetes. Who are they? They're your friends, they're your neighbor's children, they could be any child. And it's difficult to tell that they are diabetics, except that one of them is, has something special, which we'll tell you about later. <laughs> These are also children with diabetes at the Diabetes Camp Pride Camp. Um, this was in 2013. And you can see a variety of types and ages and sizes, and children who come to camp to learn a little bit about how they can do their own self-care. But what is this type 1 diabetes we're talking about? It's a disease in which their children between the ages of 6 to 18 are primarily affected, and it's an autoimmune disease, a disease in which the body produces antibodies against their own cells, and particularly the beta cells of the pancreas. 
There's a genetic risk factor in most of those patients, and there's certainly external and endogenous factors that precipitate the presentation of diabetes. In the general population, the risk of developing type 1 diabetes is only then about 0.3%. But because of that genetic link, if you have an identical twin, it can be as high as 50% risk in, you, in the personal um, patient. And if you have a sibling, or if you are a child of a, or of a, with a mother or father with diabetes, the risk can be between about 5 to 8%. But notably, more than 85% of children with type 1 diabetes have no family history, even though they may have a genetic risk. This messy slide here I left specifically because I wanted to tell you how complex the process of type 1 diabetes is. In your upper left, oh, it's not going to be your right to left, right? Um, the green blurb at the top represents the beta cells from the pancreas. It's an electron microscopic picture. And this beta cell at the pancreas is damaged or affected by a, some kind of toxic or environmental agent or virus. And that beta cells Inside the beta cells, these several cells form several cytotoxic and pathological cytokines that then make antibodies. And these are some of the antibody names that come out of the um, pancreas, that affect the pancreas, the insulin antibodies, the glutamic acid dehydrogenase antibodies. Names are not relatively important, but what's really important here is these antibodies kill the beta cell and lead to type 1 diabetes. The environmental triggers that we know about that have been studied worldwide include diet um, in the general sense, but specifically introduction of cow's milk early in a child's diet, the viral infections I mentioned earlier in the previous slide, some drugs and toxins, particularly toxins related to plasticizin and BPAs in our diets, but really and truly we don't know which environmental trigger may make that susceptible child or young adult develop type 1 diabetes. More frightening is that children are also now developing adult type or type 2 diabetes. And this is underpinned by the obesity epidemic. So type 2 diabetes, this is where the diet and the genes really interplay. It's rarely under diagnosed under the age of 10, and the pathogenesis is rather complex. But the interaction of genetics and environmental risk factors, which are exacerbated by diet and increase in obesity, is a hallmark of type 2 diabetes. And these children or young adults then develop insulin resistance in the muscle and liver and go on to even have beta cell failure as well. So in childhood, more than 75% of those children will have that first degree relative affected. And they have more risk factors than their adult counterparts. They are more likely to be in the ethnic predisposition group. And unfortunately, the whole of the Caribbean is in the ethnic predisposition group. Um, they're more likely to be obese, and they're more likely to have that significant family history. The disease often presents after the onset of puberty, because the pubertal stages also create insulin resistance, which may exaggerate the presentation of diabetes at this age group. In the US, there's a huge multi-center ethnic variety group called the US Search for Diabetes in Youth Study Group. And they published in 2014 the preliminary results of their studies looking at type 2 diabetes and type 1 in children throughout the US. What they found is that 11% of diabetic cases among children with under the age of 20 were now being classified as type 2. And this is where it had been about of only about 2% in the previous years. Between 2001 and 2009, that prevalence rate in the older child between 10 and 19 rose by 30%. And 50% of new cases of diabetes were then found in children between the ages of 15 and 19. That's extremely young for the development of diabetes. These genes and the environment, and this slide really, I just want you to look at the black arrows. Where the black arrows are, there are some yellow columns, and the yellow columns are type 1. And these type 1 diabetics are obviously more prevalent in the younger age group, but you, that arrow shows you the African-American population from the search study. And as you look on the right hand of this slide, you will see then that that same black arrow, where the yellow and orange now are half and half, these are the older children, where 
the risk now for type 2 is greater, and half of those children in that age group in the African-American population are now developing type 2 diabetes. So in childhood, we have some unique challenges. We think we may be missing some of those type 2 diabetic children, and that's because we know that the obesity rate has doubled. I think Dr. Adams spoke about obesity a couple months ago and the, and the epidemic to which we are now seeing in our Caribbean population. So the obesity rate has doubled in Barbados, even among the preschoolers and the primary school children. Professor St. John, who was part of the Barbados Health and Children's Health and Nutrition Study in 2011, and they found that at least 35% of children in the 9 to 10 age group were either overweight or obese. What does that mean to us? It means it can be challenging now to distinguish whether a child develops diabetes, whether it's truly type 1 only, or whether it's type 2, or whether it's some form of combination. There's a complex interplay of autoimmunity and obesity itself. And then the common symptoms of presentation occur both in type 1 and type 2. So we've named this the diabetes epidemic. Reality is that there's a big interplay. Type 1 diabetics are still the most common in childhood, but with the interplay of childhood obesity and type 2 disease coming closer and closer to that circle, you can see that interplay becomes a little bit more important. There are some other rare forms of childhood diabetes, which I'm just going to brush over, and they just need to think about. They're called MODI, or the maturity onset diabetes in youth, and neonatal diabetes, which is an extremely rare form of diabetes in the under six months. And these just to think about if the child presents in one of those characteristic patterns that these ones present in. But pre-diabetes, this is the tip of our iceberg. Can we get those children earlier? Now, we can only find prediabetes by screening, so you have to have a cohort of people to which you have suspicion. And suspicion means, are they in the genetic predisposition, and everyone is, and are they in the stage in which they are overweight or obese or already show signs that there may be metabolic disease present. And if that's the case, we can do a fasting blood sugar. And if they're in the range to which is not diabetic, but in these numbers where it is in this gray zone, which we call pre-diabetes, if we do a hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of diabetes or blood sugar elevations over a three-month period, and if we give them a glucose load and see how they respond two hours after, then we may get an idea whether these people are at risk. And this is quite important because it has been found that if up to about 70% of those people diagnosed as pre-diabetic, if they change their lifestyle, if they lose the weight and maintain a healthy lifestyle, they may not go on to develop diabetes. But without that, within 10 years or more, and this is talking about someone who's pre-diabetic at about, say, 11 or 12, by then 20, they may be overtly diabetic. And this is, I think, what you might be seeing in that US search study. So pre-diabetes um, increases, obviously, in the obese population. And certainly, studies have also shown that if you are significantly overweight already, then up to a quarter of that population may have what's called an impaired glucose tolerance. In other words, your numbers may be normal, but if you take a large load of sugar or glucose, you may not be able to utilize it effectively. What this means for us, when two-thirds of our children over 10 are already overweight or obese, it means that we are looking at a metabolic epidemic before our children age 30. So what are we learning about prediabetes as well? We have a, a local study, which was called a hyperglycemia and pregnancy outcome. That's what HAPO is. And that study looked at women with diabetes during their pregnancy. So these were gestational diabetes. Some of you might have heard of that term. And we're looking now at their offspring because there is a big correlation between the presence of diabetes in utero and the onset of diabetes later in life. And out of 500 asymptomatic children which have been studying that local HAPO follow-up study so far, already 17% are showing criteria for prediabetes. And I think I'll leave it at that. The real dilemmas. We need to manage our diabetic youth, and we certainly need to think about managing type 2 diabetes. We've talked about lifestyle. We've talked about lifestyle modification programs. But is that realistic for the adolescent and for the young people that we are dealing with? I'd left put in this cartoon to give you a perspective. 
say 20 years ago is cartoon to your left, and today is cartoon to your right. So 20 years ago, we were telling our children, clean your plate, eat everything, don't leave anything there. And today we have to tell them, well, you better not eat that dessert because the children are getting diabetes. So it has a new perspective, a new paradigm, a shift towards how we think about what we're eating. The outcomes, unfortunately, for pediatric type 2 diabetes are still suboptimal, and it seems to be a worse disease than type 1 because of that increasing incidence of metabolic conditions earlier. And our treatment options for type 2 diabetes in children are still suboptimal, using only metformin or glucophage, as some people may know it, and insulin in the more severe cases. But what about the type 1 diabetics? They have different requirements. It's insulin. And insulin requirements change frequently. You grow, you have puberty, you have school, you go to sports. And unfortunately, the child who is not controlled, even with type 1 diabetes, may be at risk of long-term complications which can begin in childhood. The child who's a diabetic at age 3 is 13 when they have 10 years on diabetes. And that's still quite young. And those complications can start as early as 10 to 15 years after the diagnosis with poor control. So our focus is proper insulin, good nutrition, monitoring and exercise, managing themselves because these are children who will become adults and have to learn to self-manage. We need to promote normal growth, as every child is, and we need to provide managing their glycemia or their blood sugars and ongoing education and support. The type 1 diabetics are a unique group, a younger age group. How do you manage a little person who is a diabetic who refuses to eat their dinner? So you have to think about that. How is that going to happen in your life? What about peer pressure? You're eight years old and you have to go to school and stick your finger and give, take a blood sugar and inject insulin. The peer pressures to which these younger children are exposed are tremendous. They don't want to do that in front of the others. They don't want people to know they have diabetes yet. That's because of the stigma of diabetes in the population in general. There's also insulin manipulation by teenagers because insulin can change your body image, can make you fatter or thinner, depending on how much you take and how, much, how you manage it. And then there are things like your religious and cultural influences, school meals, you know, those fantastically nutritional compliments that children get every day, um, along with the fast food epidemic that's occurring even as we speak. But I want to break here and give you a little perspective, a little case history of tea. Tea was a type 1 diabetic diagnosed a few years ago, and just to give you an idea of what happened when he was diagnosed, what his parents' view was. His mother says, T's diagnosis was something I just wasn't looking for, and to me, I thought it was a death sentence. Not knowing anything about it at the time, except it was a disease for which there's no cure, that stigma attached alone, I thought that was just a death sentence. That was the parents' view. So T's opinion, sometimes I feel good to know that I'm eating healthier. But, and better, but sometimes I'm really tempted by the things I shouldn't eat, especially when I see other people eating things like donuts and jam puffs. Then I feel really bad, and I just want to be normal. This is the life of a type 1 diabetic. So education. We not only have to educate our patients, we have to educate our families. Fear and embarrassment are sometimes a hindrance because families don't understand sometimes what it means to have diabetes and what it means to have a long-term projection of their life taking insulin. The Diabetes Association and Diabetes Foundation have been making great strides in that and the management of education. But we cannot ignore diabetes. It is there. There is no little sugar. There's always diabetes, so don't ignore it. But we need the truth, and we need to have the real, real, real truth, and we need the whole truth. So I'm going to look at a few myths and see how we can dispel some of those related to diabetes. First myth, eating too much sugar gave me diabetes. True or not true? Maybe. But it's not too much sugar, but eating too much food. Is good, leads someone to be overweight, decreases their body sensitivity to insulin, leads to insulin resistance, and in the long term, high blood sugar. But it's also the difficulty in accepting this phenomena that it's our lifestyle and our food practices that actually cause type 2 diabetes, and not just the food alone. What about infant feeding? 
in six months is now the recommended age to start on solid foods. I was in horror today because a mother told me that a nursery sent a notice saying, I am going to feed your baby at three months unless you say otherwise. And that was literally a sign up in a day nursery. And we know this is not right. We still have to advocate for the right things. There are studies that are showing when babies who are at risk of type 1 diabetes, and this is a genetic risk that you may not even know that you appreciate, had solid foods before four months, it doubled their risk of diabetes. And that's just of type 1. We're not even talking about the risk of type 2 diabetes in general. At a young age, the infant gut and immune system may not be ready for those foods. We may be putting them into a situation where it lead into other autoimmune diseases, and certainly that might be the case in susceptible children. Myth two, people with diabetes should never eat sugar because sugar causes diabetes. Remember the sugar context. Well, the government thinks so too, and maybe it's a good thing they think so because we now have the 10% sugar, and I'm calling it the sugar disincentive tax. This has given you a disincentive to buy something in high sugar content. Now, these sweet drinks on the left of the slide showing you that there are about 50 grams in 500 mils of sugar in an average soft drink. But the, the box juices that everyone thinks are so fantastic contain up to 30 grams of sugar in 250 mils. That is 60 grams of sugar in a half liter. So just as bad or worse than the soft drinks. So we have to be quite careful when we're looking at what we think is good and not so good. Myth three, it's okay for people with diabetes to eat as much sugar-free food as they want. But what is sugar-free? Often sugar-free doesn't mean no sugar at all. It may mean no added sugar, so check those labels. Artificial sweeteners may be present, and there may even be sugar alcohols as used as artificial sweeteners, such as sorbitol. And those can actually increase your caloric value, even though it may not be as much as sugar itself. But as the little cartoon at the top says, that even with no added sugar, it's still 24 grams of carbs. So, in summary, everything in moderation. Supersize is out, and portion control is in. So you can't just supersize it up, give an extra dose of insulin, and get on your way. This is not how it will work. Healthy eating is a part of prevention for type 2, but is effective in managing all types of diabetes. And I hope you can see this. Uh, the blues at the top are for diabetes prevention and management, and the reds at the bottom are the stoplight to prevent you eating as much of those fruits, jams, breads, and white breads, and eating more of the green leafy vegetables and whole grains. So myth four, a person with diabetes can tell whether his blood sugar is too high or too low just based on how he or she feels. So we can go to the booth and just count your blood sugars. This doesn't work. You need to monitor, and unfortunately, frequent testing is the gold standard. Our children are given free glucometers so they can test, but frequent testing often requires the use of strips that the drug service may not be able to supply free of cost. One box of strips costs you about $50 if you have to buy it additionally. We are fortunate that the drug service is now allowing the diabetic children and insulin type 1 diabetes to have at least 50 strips in, per month, but we can also get an additional numbers from the Diabetes Association and through the hospital. So we're not as bad as we think we might be, but certainly for those without those resources, it can be a frightening cost. How are these blood sugars measured? For those who don't know, this is a glucometer, so that tiny, tiny little drop of blood to test the blood sugar. And the more blood sugars you do per day helps with your control. So that if you do several blood sugar measurements a day, you will get better and better measurements. But can you imagine trying to do a blood sugar test 10 times a day with a prick on your finger? That's a little bit daunting. So there must be other ways to which we have to test. Uh, just to give you a little piece of information, you know, form facts that really probably mean very little. If you are diagnosed with diabetes at age five, and you're now 18, you've gone through 19,000 insulin injections as a minimum and probably 50,000 finger prick sticks. And that's only been if you were between the ages of 5 and 18. So what else are we prescribing? 
we need to prescribe exercise. Write it on the prescription pads. I know Dr. Connell has said this before. So he's, we're saying it again. So it's not just hypertension that requires the prescription, but also the diabetics too. Physical activity can be challenging. This is the children of the digital age. So you need to get them out of the house. You need to decrease their screen time. But with the child with, di with diabetes, we have to monitor how we give them their insulin and their carbohydrates because exercise can drop your blood sugars and cause hypoglycemia. So it is a bit of a balancing act with the sugars, the carbs, and the exercise. And balancing that on a tight rope can make you drop off one end or the other. So we have to educate our games and sports coaches. We have to provide support as part of the medical team. And we have to get rid of the neighborhood violence and the lack of play parks. There are also psychosocial issues. The parent who has a diabetic child is the ones who are called the diabetic parents. There's a monthly support group through the Barbados Diabetes Association that is fairly well subscribed. And all these parents, although their outlooks are different, all revolve around the same theme, to having a child with diabetes and how do you manage them, how do you advocate. But they also want to know what's new, what's better, and what's new in their technology to help them manage diabetes better. So the DAWN study, which was the Diabetes Awareness, Wishes, and Needs study, and there are actually two versions of this because they had done it in several countries throughout the world. And the perspective of this is that people with diabetes report that many aspects of their daily life are negatively impacted by their condition. And at the top, you can see it's physical health, obviously, is the most important. But you look at the bottom, their finances, their leisure activities, the emotional well-being, and these are all influenced. I would like you to take a little time out sometime later and have a look at the Twitter feed called hashtag I wish people knew what diabetes, that diabetes, and that diabetes dot dot dot, anything else that goes along with it. So, and this is Twitter feeds by people with diabetes and how they feel about their, it's impacted on their lives. However, Health professionals also agree that the family involvement is vital to good diabetes care. And many parents worry about their children, not just in how they, if they will get complications, but will they get hypoglycemia? Will they be able to manage on their own? So the parents and families are also part of this whole picture. The cost of diabetes. Overall, global scan dependent on patient care is $465 billion. Barbados ranks quite high in managing diabetes fairly well, but two-thirds of our health budget is spent on diabetes and its complications, and that's a big chunk of our medical budget. Why is there such a big cost? Because complications occur that are not only for big vessel diseases, which is macrovascular, which are strokes, heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, but in the small blood vessels, the eye disease, the renal disease, the sexual function later on, and peripheral neuropathy. And these are all add up to the cost of diabetes. Are diabetics insurable? Perhaps not, and maybe. Because if you were diagnosed with as diabetic before you had insurance, it is a pre-existing condition and will not be give granted insurance. And that's a frightening reality. For a child who is diagnosed at little, as young as three, they may not have insurance. And the cost of diabetes is escalating. Childhood diabetes becomes adult diabetes. And sometimes even in influences how you are in life. Somewhere, somehow, you still have to get on with it. We transition to adult services, and we're still unclear on how what's the best appropriate age to transfer. The pediatric population at the hospital will take us through till 16. Adolescence is still a big part of the pediatric care, and so the pediatricians will see children up to 18 to 21. But we do need to transfer to adult care because children become adults. And what we need to figure out is how do we improve attendance at these clinics because there's often a fall off in from the pediatric clinic to the adult clinic. Somewhere around the way, people don't understand what type 1 diabetes is all about. And the Barbados Diabetes Foundation has been a great help in trying to, to mirror that um, increase in attendance. So what is new in diabetes care? 
We had insulin invented essentially 90 years ago. That's just in this century insulin was, in, was not invented but discovered. And since then, we have moved from older type insulins to newer types of insulins to analog insulins to using insulins with syringes to using insulins with pens to moving from injectable to pumps and CSII is the continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion, which is what a pump means. From the big pumps to the little pumps. And the little pumps, if you can see them, are under these swimsuits. Can you see where they are under the swimsuits? Somewhere there, when the insulin pumps have now become almost standard of care if you can get one. How does a pump work? Well, it's an insulin cartridge that's put into a little reservoir inside this thing that looks like a cell phone or beeper. And there's a little tube in for most of them that can attach to the body. Or like this, it can look like a beeper with a tube in and you can have a monitor that reads to that. However, pump has its challenges and the biggest challenge is cost. Besides the cost, there are also site infections, frequent blood glucose monitoring, inconvenience in wearing, self-image modesty. The learning curve it takes to manage a pump can take from several weeks to months, months to manage a pump, but the cost is most prohibitive. For those without insurance, they're almost unlikely to be able to afford a pump at 20,000 Barbados dollars for setup. With a cost on a month being anywhere from three to $500 per month, to maintain the pump. So even though it's the magic bullet for the managing of diabetes and not given daily injections, it needs a big infusion of capital to keep it going. And I think today we have maybe about five children under the age of 18 who have insulin pumps in this country um, and all being managed, fortunately, in one center. So they, some of these issues are all managed for by one person. But are we ready to make it better? We can do the insulin infusion by pump. We can monitor the glucose continuously by using a little monitor. We can self-monitor. But can we close the loop? Can we make it all together, one thing? So the glucose monitors, which we spoke about, can be quite nice and small and intense. This one is almost like a watch. These are very small ones that can attach to your pump as well. And what do I mean by closing the loop? After we take this pattern, the, insulin, the glucose monitor tells us some things. It tells us whether we are high or low. So this is low, below normal. It tells you when you're high. But it needs to do something else to close the loop. So it tells you when you're high or low. But the future direction is it needs to speak to the pump. So there are algorithms that are now being added onto your pumps to close that loop. So you have a continuous glucose monitor you have an insulin pump, and they speak to each other. And this is the bionic pancreas, or the artificial pancreas. It is not so far out in the horizon. In fact, several people in North America already do use these. But this is the beginning of the new generation of what we are seeing. But the devices themselves may be good, and they're not the cure. And several people can't afford them. So we still need to have psychological support. We still need to have good insulin treatment. And we still need to have some problem-based education to manage diabetes. So what is in the future for us? Well, certainly, there are some nice, exciting things. And I'll just take you through a few of them. Um, one is the dog trained to manage or to, ma to detect sugar levels. And this was a CNN report. Um, the dogs were trained by licking or tasting saliva or sweat to figure out whether this child is hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic. The dogs are specially trained and certainly seem to help for the younger child who may not be able to respond to those signals that the pumps may be giving them. And it's exciting, but certainly again, special training exists and dogs need to be particularly managed well because these are service dogs, essentially. What about this? I brought this for Dr. Kohal. <laughs> I promised him I'd bring him a little bit to manage some diabetes. Again, another CNN report, the new diabetes drug. And we do know that blood sugars actually do fall when, they use, when people use marijuana. But can we legally use it to treat diabetes? And is it really safe? I'm going to leave those questions open, because that's next month's talk. <laughs> 
We also want to have some prevention with diabetes. So we have primary prevention, where we can prevent the autoimmunity occurring in high-risk patients, or we try to look in that aspect of it. We can prevent the progression of diabetes when the antibodies are already present. And we can try and look at prevention in relation to not losing any more of those beta cells when diabetes is already diagnosed. So this is where the targeted timelines are for these prevention. We don't know what the triggers are, but we're going to try and prevent them at that genetic predisposition stage. When diabetes is already starting with autoimmunity, there are drugs that we can target that autoimmune stage. We can look at preservation here of the beta cells at the stage in which there's pre-diabetes, and in the clinical onset to look at regeneration of cells. And these are all being managed not only experimentally but in clinical trials throughout the particularly US and Europe at this moment. But what about this residual insulin, that last bit when you're already diagnosed? That's quite important and I think this is the target that we probably reach first because the residual insulin makes it easier to get good blood sugar control. It's the complications then are less, there's the less risk of late complications and perhaps some patients who maintain some secretion of insulin may even go into remission and maybe a virtual cure. We can also prevent type 2 diabetes, healthy foods, increasing access to high quality and affordable foods, increasing physical activity both in school and the community, looking about pricing strategies, we talked about taxes before, and certainly reducing use exposure to the marketing of unhealthy foods. But this is ongoing. But then there's several trials to which we are looking at which will help in the prevention both at the individual stage when the genetically um, risk patient as well as those who may already have diabetes where in the European studies we're looking at the use of nicotinamide and the trial net studies to look at things called the GAD alum um, vaccines which could help in the prevention of ongoing diabetes. Sorry. A cure. Um, this is the under horizon. But what do we actually really mean by a cure? We mean diabetes in which you will have to barely monitor, occasionally monitor, where you can sleep without thinking of having your blood sugar may drop during your sleep. You have a free diet, eat anything you want to, and have minimal side effects. So this is a wish list for a true practical cure. There are also future autoantigen therapies, which are on the market and in clinical trials. There are the therapies for the autoantigens, such as the GATA positive patients. These are antibodies that produce, um, that destroy beta cells. We can also look at the receptors antagonists for those cytokines that destroy the beta cells we spoke about earlier, and combining drugs which stimulate beta cell regeneration. Stem cell research and transplantation of stem cells is also on the horizon. Fetal stem cells have been used, but most recently pancreatic duct cells or new cells with insulin secretion capacity have been implanted. And in the University of Minnesota, two years ago, they started a, a program where they used cadaveric pancreas, extracted beta cells, and re-injected them into recipient livers. This is also being done to some extent in the UK as well. And this is still very, very, very early in the experimental stages. And we still don't know whether this will reverse diabetes for those patients who get these stem cells. Well, actually not stem cells, beta cells extracted. There's gene therapy as well, where genes can be transferred to prevent those people at risk from getting diabetes, but this is still only very experimental. And with all of that, we do need to have something right away to help us. So all these modern techniques, a little bit of intelligence, and diabetes shouldn't be any problem, right? Diabetes is not a problem. We have the brains. We have all the mechanisms. So why aren't we getting it? It's because it's actually not so simple. There's a lot of interplay with the genetics of diabetes. We do know that we have the monitors and to manage, but they're still not extremely useful for everyone because they're very cost, um, costly and certainly not available for most of our population. So in summary, I just want to say that we have had many, many advances in diabetes in the last two decades. We have improved insulins, we have better insulin delivery systems, we have glucose and ketone monitoring right here in Barbados, better. 
and we have good laboratory assessment. But childhood diabetes specifically doesn't just need the test. It doesn't only need a cure. It needs good support. It needs a system in which the patient, parents, friends, neighbors, schools, and everyone in the healthcare system comes together for that child and works as a team. Yes, there are going to be advances later on, and there are several years ahead before some of those advances I spoke about are going to be on the market. But the research is progressing. The NIH through the NIDKK, NIDDK, which is the Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Disease arm of the NIH, has just put out $2.5 billion in research towards prevention and cure of diabetes. We are going to get there, but it's not going to be today. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, just to tell you, the sweet phenomena, ref if we have refined sugar withdrawal, just enough food, adequate exercise, we may transform diabetes earlier than you think. And as our QC says, fiat lux means let there be light for those who are non-QC people, and feta lux means is the light is being carried. So for those QC alumni and, well, no students here specifically, and we all QC on the left side over this side here, Thank you very much for your time and attention. Keep calm, support diabetes. We are a big group, and remember that type one is still there. Thank you.